Good morning. Would you turn to Micah 3 with us as we continue our study of the prophet Micah? Before we dive in, I want to tell you why I really, really want you to listen closely to the sermon this morning. I always want you to listen. Uh, I want you to listen because it's God's word. But I feel a, a burden on my heart this morning as your pastor for you to pay heed to God's word, to be on the edge of your seat and to listen what he has to say to you this morning. And here's why. Spiritual presumption is so dangerous. Spiritual presumption is so dangerous. Now, what is that? What, what do I mean? What is spiritual presumption? Well, it's this idea that, you know, I can be a Christian, but it doesn't really matter how I live. It's the idea that because of grace, I could live however I want. I could do whatever I want. I can sin however I want. It doesn't matter. I'm good. I'm safe. God will save me in the end. So things like holiness, obedience, ongoing repentance, those are like sort of optional. That's not true. Spiritual presumption is to presume upon grace. And that's dangerous. Let me show you an example of this in Jeremiah 7. Okay, so this is, he's prophesying about 100 years after the time of Micah. And God's people, a hundred years later, are still presuming upon grace. So, so if what I've said so far is not clear, I think this passage will make it clear. So look at this on the screen. Jeremiah 7. This is spiritual presumption. God says, Behold, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered, only to go on doing these abominations? That's spiritual presumption. I think you can see why that's so dangerous. Now, I'm preaching it this morning because it's in our passage, not because I think that's where any of you are right now. But if you are, then I think God brought you here to hear that message. And if you're not, then this is at least a merciful warning for you not to go there, to not presume upon God's grace. Now, in Micah's day, the leaders of Judah were totally corrupt. There was a deep incongruence between their religious beliefs and their ethics. And they didn't give a rip or think that God even cared. They presumed they were safe and that God would save them, and they were wrong. In our passage, Micah confronts these leaders for their sin and their injustice, and he warns of coming judgment. And as we consider this passage this morning, I pray that God would help us see if there is any incongruence between what we say we believe and our ethics and how we live. I pray that we would bring into alignment our behaviors with our beliefs about God and who he is and how he has saved us, as we were just singing about together this morning, that we, that this passage would help us live faithfully this week for Christ. Because obedience and holiness and ongoing repentance is what true Christians do. Imperfectly, right? But sincerely. Sincerely. 
That's our plan this morning. You with me? Okay. First of two points on the screen. Number one, God holds leaders accountable. God holds leaders accountable. Why don't you listen as I start to read our passage, verses one through four, and this is what it says. And I said, hear you heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel. Is it not for you to know justice? You who hate the good and love the evil, who tear the skin from off my people and their flesh from off their bones, who eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them and break their bones in pieces and chop them up like meat in a pot, like flesh in a cauldron. Then they will cry to the Lord, but he will not answer them. He will hide his face from them at that time because they have made their deeds evil. The word of the Lord. What is Micah talking about? That is an unsettling image that sounds like silence of the lambs. Why is it in the Bible? And what does it mean? Well, Micah is confronting civil leaders who had been metaphorically cannibalizing God's people. Thus, the image there. He's actually addressing the judges whose job was to apply God's law rightly and settle disputes fairly. Do you guys remember how um, Moses appointed judges when the children of Israel were in the wilderness? Do you remember how his father-in-law Jethro said, Moses, you can't do everything. You're going to wear yourself out. You need help. You know, you do the big cases and you appoint judges in all the tribes and they'll handle the, the smaller disputes. Remember that? That's in Exodus chapter 18. So that's what Moses did. But what did Jethro tell Moses? What kind of men should Moses appoint as judges? Do you remember? He said, look for able men who fear God and hate a bribe. That's the kind of judge you want. Well, in Micah's day, the courts were being run by men who were characteristically the opposite. They did not fear God and they loved a good bribe. And so what happens in, in such an environment? You can't have a just society when the judges are corrupt. What you have is, in Judah, constant miscarriages of justice, particularly for the poor and the disadvantaged. And this probably goes back to what we thought about last week in chapter two. Do you remember that? You remember we thought about these landowners who were being cheated out of their houses and their fields by unethical businessmen. They were somehow seizing their properties and putting these Israelites out on the streets. And these poor people had no recourse because in the court, these businessmen could just grease the judge's hand and get away with it. Notice Micah's sting, stinging rebuke in verse 2. Look at, look at what he says to these judges. He says, you who hate the good and love the evil. In other words, they despised everything that was right and just and pure, and they loved, they loved what was unjust and untrue and impure. Friends, listen, sin isn't simply doing bad things. It often includes loving the wrong things. Sin isn't fundamentally what people do. It's more fundamentally what they love. In other words, man, man's sinful behaviors spring from his disordered loves, to use Augustine's thinking. So how do you change your behavior? How do you change sinful behavior? 
you must change what you love. And how do you change what you love? Well, Tim Keller said this, and I think it's really helpful. He said, the only way to change what you love is to change what you worship. Think about that. The only way to change what you love is to change what you worship. How do you change your behavior? You got to change what you love. How do you change what you love? Change what you worship. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. Now, I actually assume that these judges were worshiping God in the temple, like most Israelites, all of them were doing in, in Jerusalem. They were worshiping the right God in the right place, but clearly their worship was insincere, right? It was skin deep. Uh, it was superficial. What did Jesus say to the religious leaders? You know, they honor me outwardly with their lips, but their hearts are what? Far from me. Yeah, they're going through the motions, they're jumping through the hoops, they're keeping the ceremonial law, but they did not love the Lord their God with all their heart and soul and strength. What did they love? Well, they loved bribes. They loved money. And that's really what they worshiped. No wonder Jesus warned us no one can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other or despise the one and love the other. You remember what he said next? You can't serve God and what? Money. Now notice the consequence for these corrupt judges in verse 4. Then they will cry to the Lord, but he will not answer them. He will hide his face from them at that time. Pause there for a second. Do you know what that is right there? That's the reversal of Aaron's blessing. What's Aaron's blessing? May the Lord keep you and bless you. May he make his face shine upon you. And, and God was going to hide his face from them in that day. Why? Because they had made their deeds evil. When the Assyrian invasion came to their front door, which Micah predicted in chapter 1 and 2, these corrupt judges would cry out to God, but he won't answer. So just as they closed their ears to the cries of the poor and those being tricked and evicted from their homes, just as they closed their ears to them, God would close his ears to their cries. As I said last week, nothing escapes God's watchful eye. He sees everything. He sees what's in our hearts. And really, nobody gets away with anything. You realize that? You understand that justice at most is, is delayed, but it's never averted. Every sin, every crime, every injustice will be paid for in the end, either on the cross or in eternity. That is, you say death and taxes are certain. That is certain. That God will have justice in the end. Micah then turns to another group who he confronts and calls out. Look at that in verse 5 with me. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray, who cry peace when they have something to eat, but declare war against him who puts nothing into their mouths. So who's he confront now? The prophets, you're paying attention. Now, were these true prophets or false prophets? It seems that they were true prophets, at least at one time, until they started altering their prophetic word for their own selfish gain. So if you paid them well, you got a good prophecy. You got a fortune cookie prophecy, prosperity and, and peace. But if you didn't pay, you got smacked down by the prophets. They told you that you're in a heap of trouble with God because they didn't pay up. Now, presumably, the corrupt establishment got all the good prophecies. Why? Because they could pay. Well, the poor and disadvantaged got these bad prophecies. Do you know what that is? Can I tell you what that is? That is textbook spiritual abuse. Spiritual abuse. 
that is spiritual abuse. I mean, these greedy prophets are using God's name and their prophetic office to exploit people and feed their greed. You wonder why God is angry at the leaders of Judah, his covenant people? That's why. But then you know what Micah does next? He shows us by contrast what a true prophet looks like, what a true prophet does. And that's in verse eight. He's talking about himself, but this is not a humble brag. This is what a true prophet looks like, verse eight on the screen. But as for me, I am filled with power, with the spirit of the Lord and with what? Justice and might to do what? To declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. So what is a true prophet? What is he filled with? Not greed, the Holy Spirit. A true prophet defends the weak. A true prophet confronts injustice. And a true prophet calls sin, sin. Now, when we get to chapter 6, we're going to think about the key verse of the whole book of Micah which is, you know, this is what the Lord requires, that you do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with your God. So we're gonna think about that important verse in a few weeks. But let me just say now that whatever else doing justice means, it seems to include having the moral courage to call sin, sin. And according to God's definition and his righteous standards. Teenagers, I prayed for you this week. And my prayer was that you would have the moral courage to call sin, sin. Even as you, and some of you are, passionate about doing justice and helping the weak, I want to spur you on to to that. But hold that, hold justice and truth together because they cannot be separated. And part of truth is knowing what God says is evil and sin and an offense to him. Which means we can't take sin lightly. Isn't that right? Isn't that exactly what the prophets were doing whom Micah confronts here? They had shirked their responsibility to confront the establishment's sin and deal with their own sin. Beloved, can I tell you something that I think you already know? God hates sin. And I don't think we, we scarcely understand how much that is so. God hates sin. You know, if you're here and you're just not used to sitting in church or thinking about Christianity, I probably sound like a Bible thumping, you know, I don't know, fire and brimstone, fundamentalist to you, whatever. I'm just telling you what God says in his word. You know, God hates sin. He is utterly opposed to sin. Why is that? Because it dishonors him and it harms people. (laughs) It harms the people he loves and made in his image and it distorts his image and it destroys his creation. And how could he not get angry at sin? How could he not? He wouldn't be God if he didn't. And so there's a consequence coming for these prophets. Look at what that is on the screen. Verses six and seven. Therefore, it shall be night to you without vision and darkness to you without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets and the day shall be black over them. The seers shall be disgraced and the diviners put to shame. And pause there for a second. First of all, and I don't even have time to talk about this, but part of the problem with these prophets is they're using divination, which is pagan. So they're practicing pagan rituals in their prophetic ministry. And and that's part of why Micah's confronting them. So they're going to be put to shame. They shall cover their lips for there is no answer from God. What does that mean? What's the consequence here? Well, their prophetic gift is going to be revoked. And God is going to turn the lights off for them on their revelation, their insight. They're going to be exposed as frauds and they're going to be utterly disgraced. 
Friend, if you want to know how God feels about sin, I would encourage you to just start reading the Bible from the beginning. You're going to come six chapters in. Six chapters in, you're going to see how God destroys the world in a flood because man had corrupted his ways upon the earth. Eventually, you're going to come to the Gospels where Jesus uses just hair-raising imagery to warn of the reality of hell. And that's going to tell you something of how God feels about sin. But if you want, if you want to see the clearest demonstration of how God feels about humanity's sin, look at the cross. Look at the cross. Think long and hard about the meaning of the cross because that is where God poured out holy wrath upon the Son, His sinless Son, who voluntarily bore our sins in our place. The cross, show, God shows the world that he is holy and he will not accept sinners into his presence unless their sin is dealt with, unless their sin is punished. So the cross shows us what God thinks of our sin. Yet, friends, look at me. Everybody look at me, please. The cross is also the clearest demonstration of God's mercy and his love because it's at the cross that God justifies the ungodly. It's at the cross that God brings countless sinners into his presence through the atonement of his son who paid for their sins on their behalf. So if you want to know the mercy of God and how he feels about sin, look at his son and look at the cross. Friend, if you're not a Christian, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, you could be forgiven of all your sin. All of your offenses against God and neighbor could be wiped clean if you would look to Christ, trust in him, and receive his mercy. And if you want to, if you want to know more about what that means, then I'd love to read through the gospel of Mark with you. Maybe you've never even read the Bible before. I'll read through Mark with you and I'll, I'll try to help you understand more about who Jesus is and what it means to follow him. How you can know that you are forgiven and that you'll be forever in his holy presence. So brothers and sisters, what happens when we think lightly of sin? We think lightly of God. We think lightly of the Savior. We think lightly of the cross. What happens when we take sin seriously and soberly? Well, we're on our way to thinking well about God and his character, both his holiness and his mercy. Okay, lastly on this point, okay? You still with me? Okay, lastly on this point, Micah also shows us that a leader's character matters. A leader's character matters. And he holds accountable leaders who will misuse or abuse their authority that he's given to them. So, so I wonder, friend, how have you used your authority? At home or at work? Maybe you're a business owner or maybe you manage a bunch of employees. How have you used your authority? How have you used your authority in the classroom, teacher, or coach, or civil servant, or maybe at church? How have you used your authority at church? Husbands, husbands, look at me. How have you used your authority at home? Is your spouse flourishing under your protective care? God will hold us accountable, brothers. I often remind myself of 1 Peter where it says to husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way lest your prayers be hindered. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want my prayers to be hindered. I don't want God to withhold his blessing from my life, from my family, or from this church because of the way I have misused my authority. And so I want to think really carefully about and wisely about how I use my authority. And you should too. Because God holds leaders accountable. Every parent, every pastor, every teacher, 
every coach, every judge, every police officer, every president, the one in the office now, the one trying to get back into office, will give an account to God someday and how they and how we used our authority that he bestowed to us will be part of his evaluation. So friends, use your authority to bless, not to curse, to heal, not to harm, to give, not to selfishly take. As a matter of fact, help the people under your authority know better what God is like because of the way you've used your authority for them to flourish. Does that make sense to you? Okay, point number two, don't presume upon grace. Let's continue in verse nine. Hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, who detest justice and make crooked all that is straight, who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity, Its heads give judgment for a bribe. Its priests teach for a price. Its prophets practice divination for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins and the mountain of the house a wooded height. What does that last part mean? It means the temple's gonna be destroyed and wild animals are gonna run through and make nests in the temple as if it were the, the forest. Now, do you see why I say the whole establishment had become corrupt? Look at the three branches, judges, prophets, and priests, all corrupted by greed. And that resulted in, a, in, in, in all kinds of injustice against God's people. What does it say? They built Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. What does that mean? Well, we know that during the time of Micah, there was a bunch of of expansive building projects happening in Jerusalem. And it seems that there was forced labor involved and that some of these laborers were dying, maybe because of unsafe conditions or because of the, the speed at which they were supposed to get the job done. And their blood was on the hands of these leaders. That's what Micah's saying. You know, we could imagine Micah preaching this message. This is his sermon notes from an actual message. We can imagine him preaching it to all these leaders in Judah when they're all together assembled at the temple, maybe for one of the feasts. Do you imagine the courage that it took to call them out publicly? You know, when I was a kid, I I remembered so well hearing about this Roman Catholic priest who publicly confronted then President Clinton for taking communion in an unworthy manner. This was public at a service because he said that the president's hands were stained with the blood of aborted babies. And he actually said to him, God will hold you accountable. Now (laughs) that took courage. And I think moral courage is needed in our day. And I'm not suggesting that Christians be rude or combative. I don't think it's courage to just post rants on social media. But as Christians, as we live and interact in the world, sooner or later, we will have opportunity to speak with clarity about what God says, about what grieves his heart, about what he calls evil. And I pray that we would have courage and wisdom in our prophetic witness even if it costs us. And it probably will because there's, there's a reason why they say, well, they always killed the prophets, <laughs> right? Notice verse 11. This verse really struck me. Its heads give judgment for a bribe. Its priests teach for a price. Its prophets practice divination for money. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. Do you hear the presumption there? Do you hear the arrogant overconfidence? It reminds me of a scene in in the Titanic. Do you remember the movie, the Titanic? Remember when the ship is filling up with water and, and there's a huddle in the captain's you know, chambers, and, and then the one guy goes, but Titanic can't sink. And then the engineer responds, she's made of iron, sir. I assure you, she can. 
I think I did the accent better at the last service. Anyway. <laughs> well, it's like Judah's leaders here are saying, the Lord is in the midst of us. She can't sink. God won't allow his people and the temple to be destroyed. And Micah's saying, I assure you, she can. And the ship is going to go down because they presumed upon grace. They thought God is on our side and it doesn't really matter that we're trampling on his law. And they were wrong. And Micah tells them, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruin. By the way, God told them centuries ago that that would happen. He warned them over and over and over and over in his word and through the prophets that they would be evicted from the land if they transgressed the covenant. And that's what happened. Okay, now what about us? What about us? What does presuming upon grace look like today? Well, here's a quote from Phil Riken that I think is helpful. Riken said, quote, God has saved you from sin, not for sin. If you are unrepentant about lust, bitterness, greed, or any sin whatsoever, you are presuming upon God's grace. Let me, let me say that again. Riken said, God has saved you from sin, not for sin. If you are unrepentant about lust, bitterness, greed, or any sin whatsoever, you are presuming upon God's grace. Now, friends, understand that he's not talking about a Christian who is, who is just genuinely struggling against their sin, right? He's not talking about a Christian who sins and then is grieved by their sin and earnestly desires to change. That's not who he's talking about. He's talking about people who are lukewarm and loving it. They sin, they sin as a way of life without any conviction or godly remorse. They're unrelenting in their bitterness. They're unrelenting in their lust or in their greed. Friends, a true Christian, a true Christian gets bitter, but they hate their bitterness and they make war on it with the spirit. A true Christian will lust, but they hate their lust and they're making war on it by the Spirit. Do you see the difference? Do you see the difference? Here's the scariest part about spiritual presumption. It's often coupled with self-deception. In other words, the person presuming upon grace hears a sermon like this, they don't know it's for them. They think it's for somebody else. Because they're like, what, me? I'm not really all that bad. I go to church. You know, I, I know the songs. I read the Bible. I said the sinner's prayer. I even teach Sunday school. I'm in the kingdom. And even on the last day, they're deceived because they say to Jesus, well, wait a minute. Didn't we believe all the right things? Didn't we do all the right things? We assumed that we were on your team. And Jesus will say, you presumed wrongly and I never knew you. That's Matthew 7. You see there in verse 11 where Micah says about these leaders, they lean on the Lord. Well, that sounds like a good thing, but you know what he's really saying? They say they lean on the Lord, but they really don't. It's hollow talk. Now, friends, here, here's, the mer here's the mercy in this passage. You ready for mercy? Here's the mercy God sent Micah to preach to them. In his mercy, he sent Micah to preach to them. He sent me to preach to you today after I've been preaching to myself all week. Because a prophet confronts the people's sin so that they will come to repentance. And that's my hope for you if you are presuming upon God's grace. And I prayed that his kindness would lead you to repentance, that you, even if you're living a double life and nobody knows about it, you will bring that out into the light. You will forsake your sin and follow Christ faithfully because I trust there's at least someone in this room that the Holy Spirit is tapping on the shoulder right now. 
And I would just say, do not harden your heart to him. Spiritual presumption is not dangerous, it's deadly. Now I'm gonna give us a chance to pray as we prepare our hearts to take the Lord's Supper, but I just wanna do one more thing. I wanna say one more thing, okay? Hang with me. Let me just come back to something I said earlier. The only way to change our sinful behavior is to change what we love. The only way to change what we love is to change what we worship. How does Micah 3 help us worship Christ so that he changes us? Well, here's what helped me. I'll tell you and then I'm done. As I looked at this passage, I saw that in Micah's day, God's people had corrupt judges, corrupt priests, and corrupt prophets. Its heads give judgment for a bribe. Its priests teach for a price. Its prophets practice divination for money. They were all corrupt. The leaders of God's people were corrupt. What a travesty. And then I realized that they're all antitypes. Do you know what I mean by that? In other words, they're all, they're the antithesis of another judge, another prophet, and another priest, namely Jesus. What do I mean? Well, think about it, okay? Jesus is the righteous judge who never judges with partiality. Jesus is the prophet who defends the weak and confronts the establishment of his day. Jesus is the faithful priest who doesn't teach for a price, but at the cost of his own life, helps us know the Father. In other words, he's the righteous judge, he's the true prophet, and he's the faithful priest. Do you, do you see that? Do you see the character of Jesus? Do you see that he never takes advantage of anybody? Do you see that he never fleeces people or exploits them? How does Jesus use his authority? Not to curse, but to bless. Not to harm, but to heal. Not to selfishly take, but to lavishly give. <laughs> the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. You imagine? So what am I doing? What am I doing right now? What am I praying and hoping that you're doing right now? I'm praying and hoping that you're looking at Christ through eyes of faith and just adoring him and being captivated by him and worshiping him. Do you know why? Because that's how you will change. That is how you will change. You want to change your behavior? Then change what you love. You want to change what you love? Then change what you worship. If you worship money, it'll kill you. If you worship Christ, he will change you. Let's pray. Lord, help us now as we come to your table of grace. After we have heard your word, now we're, we're going to see your word in the elements of communion as they depict our Lord's body and his blood. So help us not take in an unworthy manner. We recognize our unworthiness to be at your table, yet we also remember your blood that washes us clean and brings us into your presence now and forever through the atoning work of our risen Christ. We praise you now as we come to this table of grace. In Jesus' name, amen.